I wanted to paint people in situations in everyday life that would be appealing and meaningful to other people to look at, the kind of pictures that they'd want to come back and see. So I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and um, I started wandering the streets of Brooklyn and going into restaurants and stores and looking for uh, inspiration. And then it occurred to me to uh, go to Coney Island. I'd heard about Coney Island, and it certainly has been the subject of a lot of artistic endeavor. From the first moment I went there, there was a, a feeling of recognition because here was the big city, but it was right by the seashore, and I was used to the seashore from growing up in Florida. The late 70s, and New York was bankrupt, and it was in terrible straits. And uh, Coney Island was no exception. Coney Island had been built as a, a playground for upper middle class people, upper income people. But by the time I got there, it was, it was really depressed and there were very few rides. They were, what was left was very tawdry, very cheap. No more pretense of being a glamorous spot. But that was perfect, I love that. Um, I love the fact that it, it wasn't gonna put on any airs, that people were unselfconscious. These were people who were just there on their day off to have as much fun as they could. I, I would wander around and I didn't know what I was looking for. On those first early trips to Coney Island, I did see some amazing things. A bunch of young men and a shooting gallery. I, I saw a couple having their photos taken in a photo booth. Scenes that I had never, I, would, I wouldn't have been able to think these up and they really struck me right away. They became my earliest paintings and, uh, and always uh, were my um, touchstones for later paintings. Do they come up to this level of engagement? The paintings I started, um, they were from early photographs and I started painting them large because I wanted the people to be the same size that we are or close to it so that you would feel that they were in the room with you. But they were flat and they looked too much like photographs. So I began to look, what makes paintings really like paintings? And I remembered the water lilies that are in the Museum of Modern Art, Monet's water lilies. And I went and I looked at them. I had my face about 12 inches from them. And I got lost in the brush strokes and the thick, thick paint. And I thought, yes, this is what I have to have. The search finally ended with the inspiration to put wax in the paint. At first I would melt the wax in the in a hot pan on a stove and mix it with the paint. I remember at this time, um, I was being told that realist painting is not gonna go anywhere. Uh, you have to be an abstractionist and you have to do large abstractions. And so I had thought, well, I'm never gonna do large abstractions, but I just wanna know what that feels like. So I had this big canvas, a very big canvas, and I started slapping a lot of paint on it and it was covered with paint. And then I sat looking at it and I said, I hate this picture, I hate this picture. And I sanded down the paint and then all of a sudden I thought, hey, this is actually a nice texture. So then I used that as the texture for a painting called Summer Wishes. I had scraped down and sanded down the, the goopy paint from, uh, from an abstraction. And then I painted my realist painting on top of that. Paint texture is important also because it's like sculpture. And when I started doing sculpture, I realized that sculpture is really about the surface. You don't look inside a sculpture and you don't look at just one angle of the sculpture. You walk around it and you look at the surface all over. And I began to realize that the surface being so important, why isn't it important in painting? The surface gives you a sense that it's really there, it's really a physical property, that you can see it begin to build and mold uh, a form. And so that became, uh, that really became the inspiration. These large texture paintings are much more like sculpture than anything I could have imagined. It was almost as if I could put my hands around them and, and hug them because I was thinking so hard about the surfaces of the subject matter. Well, why don't we think of painting as more physical? We think of painting as something, an idea, it's an image, it's a vision. We don't think of it as a physical object. 
I had no intention of doing any other kind of painting than the Coney Island. That was going to be my life work. I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else and didn't want to. The whole living situation and the whole um, studio situation changed. And I, um, I had to start uh, a different kind of painting and that became the landscapes. The kind of paint that I had in the Coney Island, my love of that paint is not so different from my love of painting that I do outdoors with a very fast brush stroke, trying to capture the exact right color, trying to express uh, movement and so forth. When I first started doing these paintings, I could stand 120 feet away. My loft was so big that I could stand back 120 feet and look at my painting and say, hmm, so that's what it looks like from 120 feet. And then I could walk right up and stick my nose against it and say, hmm, that's what it looks like from three inches. And uh, the, the quest became how to make that all one thing, how to make that um, all one picture. I had done a picture of the, of the Wonder Wheel, which was the big attraction at Coney Island. And I had done a picture of a young man and a girl standing in front of the Wonder Wheel, and they weren't talking to each other. I thought, oh, maybe nobody's going to want this picture. And, um, and then somebody came into the gallery and said, I want that picture. And the gallery owner said, well, okay, fine, but, but why? And he said, I came to America as an immigrant, as an 18-year-old, with no money and no hopes and no ideas. And the first place I went to was Coney Island, and I saw the Wonder Wheel. And he said, I wandered around Coney Island, and I saw this beautiful girl. And he said, I walked up to that girl, and I said, if you'll be my wife, I'll buy this Wonder Wheel for you. And he said, I did. She married me and I bought the Wonder Wheel for her and that's why I want this painting. The Serpentina shows a young girl holding a very large snake and she's got a smile on her face while she's being looked at by a young man in a top hat. I was walking down the, down the boardwalk and there was a sideshow, just a kind of like a pop-up sideshow and it said Serpentina. And then out comes this young girl, very pretty young girl in a sequined dress, and she's holding a big snake. And I just popped my camera up and took a picture of her before she could even register that I was there. And, oft, and I, I didn't realize at the time, but there was a man standing next to her. And then I cast the guy as the barker of the carnival sideshow. So he was in the role of somebody saying, come and see Serpentina. And I never really planned to have anybody have a certain reaction to it. And, but in a way, I'm glad that some people find it um, a little bit out of their ordinary uh, a range of uh, things they want to see. When I, I first uh, started doing this, I, I didn't have models. And it wasn't until much later that I was able to afford models and having the models, I realized that I could actually create scenes just on the barest suggestion of some kind of a situation. And an example of that is the painting called Seafood. And I had uh, my model, Talia, come to the studio and I gave her a role. And I said, you're going to be a young waitress at a restaurant, and a seafood restaurant, and you're about to start a day shift. Talia being an actress, was able to go into the part very well, took the pose herself and was in the right costume. And I painted her and then all that was required was to photograph the background, which why make it up? There is a restaurant called Martel's that's a seafood restaurant. And so I placed her inside Martel's restaurant. You know, um, I don't think of these pictures as telling stories. I think of them as kind of like a frozen moment. It's as if you walked into a movie theater and you saw the projection on the screen and nobody had told you what had happened before or what was going to happen later. You just peeked in the movie theater and saw that scene and then you walked out. And you're left to uh, figure out who are those people and what's going to happen to them. This exhibition is very important to me. I've waited my, well, for 40 years. Uh, this is the first time that the earliest paintings had been shown with the latest paintings. 
This is the first time that they have been borrowed from collectors and have come up to view. This is the first time they've been put into a catalog. So it actually is very frustrating that because of the virus that maybe only a few people will get to see it. It's a, a very big disappointment. But, uh, but still, I guess for my own satisfaction, yes, it's, I can walk through that gallery and see, see my 40 years of work uh, all together for the first time. For me, it's like walking into a party and seeing all these familiar faces. You know, I really didn't have any message or I, I didn't feel like I had anything I was trying to communicate. And actually, as it turns out, I'm much more interested in the reactions that people have to the paintings than what I intended. Really what I want is people to come back to the painting and see what is in their own experience that they can find an echo of. And it's not something that I'm trying to put there. It's something I want them to bring themselves. And I was interviewed for a newspaper and they said, what is your best quality? And I said, my perseverance. And they said, what is your worst quality? And I said, that would be perseverance as well, because once I get onto something, yeah, I just don't get off of it. And once I got onto this Coney Island series, once I started painting, it was gonna be every single day I was gonna wake up and paint these paintings.